Good morning, River Valley. How are you today? It's a wonderful day outside. Beautiful. If you're working from home or if you're not able to get out, poke your head out the door. Or if you're out and abroad, poke your head out the door. You you might also have a gorgeous, wonderful day like we do right here in Martinsville, Indiana. I have just a few announcements. Today, we're having a Labor Day service. Um, next weekend is Grandparents' Day. That is always wonderful um, because the, the children, the grandchildren all come together and, and they're going to provide pictures with the family next uh, Sunday. Uh, 9.15, uh, we're going to meet in Mooresville at the Mooresville Cinema for the God's Not Dead movie. And that is amazing. We rent the entire cinema out. So come and, and enjoy that with us. Uh, on 10 6, friend day, and there's a meal after church. Um, 10, 10, 10 to 10 13 is the Fall Foliage Festival. 10 13 is the Fall Foliage Parade. 1026 is the coat drive that's going to be amazing. I don't know if I have all the information, but they are still looking for volunteers. So if you can, uh, please volunteer. Yes, uh, Friday, October 25th, 9 to noon for this setup. Saturday, October 26th, 9.30 to 1 for the giveaway event. And Saturday, October 26th, 1 to 4 to reset the sanctuary and store the leftover coats. And always, if you can donate um, for coats, um, you can uh, write a check here, uh, send money here, and they will go out and shop for those brand new coats. Or if you have a brand new coat with the tags on it, we will take it with gladness. Um, uh, then what else do I have? Uh, 1026 Fall Harvest Festival. Uh, 1029 for all you parents. The, the Hoops League, amazing, amazing Hoops League starts up. Um, and then 11-3 is the RBCC 20th anniversary. So that's going to be quite a celebration. Um, those are just a few of the highlights of what's in the brochure today. And let me just see if I can find anything else. Gift and tie to give online. Text 765-200-6151. To give by mail, please send it to RBCC, 4295 Egbert Road, Martinsville, Indiana, 46151. Thank you for giving to River Valley, and thank you so much for participating with us and worshiping with us together online. Have a great morning. We're getting ready to go. Good morning, River Valley. This is our Sunset Stadium, please. Good morning, River
That sounds familiar. Those are some of the lyrics from a song called We Remember by Zach Williams. What I ask you today is just the very simplest of, of things as we come to the table is don't forget. Don't forget what he did. Don't forget that God sent his unconditional love to die for us. His son. And as we come to the table, 
Let's just remember that. Nothing else today. So as we go to it, remember the sacrifice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the unconditional love you sent to save us. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for your son's broken body. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for his blood that was shed so that we might have forgiveness and feel of grace. Lord, thank you so much. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> It's time for the children to be able to leave for their time of teaching, teenagers as well, if you want to go. I'd like you to stand with me right now <coughs> to greet somebody around you, welcome them to River Valley Christian Church, and uh, say happy Labor Day weekend. Happy Labor Day weekend to all of you and to mom and dad out there. Good morning. So good to see you here today. Oh my God! Happy Labor Day weekend. See those sitting around us and know that we are a mission of worship and drawing near to God. Uh, in each row there is a notebook. I think it looks blue, maybe black. If you'll grab that and uh, sign your name and let us know. If you're here every week, please sign your name. Just let us know if you want to uh, write a little note to me. We read those on Monday or Tuesday and uh, we try to respond. If you haven't heard, let's keep us posted. If you're a guest, if you can give us a phone number or an email or address, some way to begin to contact with you, we'd love to introduce ourselves to you. But most of all, we want to introduce you to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, it's Labor Day weekend. Has anybody told you that? Yes! It's a, it's a good weekend. Uh, I hope you got Monday off. Uh, Amen. So it's Labor Day weekend, and uh, we are going to use this Labor Day to train a new person in our ministry. Uh, we've got Jude Hiles in the sound booth, and he's going to run our PowerPoint. Would you give Jude a hand? He's going to work for the Lord in uh, this time of teaching, preaching. And it's also Labor Day weekend. I think it's appropriate that 30 years ago, my wife was in labor uh, on the first day of September with Jamie, who is here in worship today. Would you give Jamie my baby? <laughs> and, uh, Labor Day. What an appropriate way to be a church and celebrate a new decade for Jane. We just talked to her about that. She's growing up, and she's growing up like Joseph. She's using her integrity for God. We want to talk about being faithful in prosperity, and uh, I want you to see this uh, first slide. Uh, 
Charles Swindoll, in his book, Growing Deep in the Christian Life, tells a story about a man and his uh, uh, a friend who went to a, a girlfriend, went to a, a fried chicken place to buy dinners for himself and, and his date one afternoon. The attendant at the fast food outlet, however, inadvertently gave him the proceeds and a bucket from that place along with the food and uh, it gave him more than just fried chicken. Well, Swindoll says after riding to their picnic site, these two customers sat down to enjoy some chicken, but they discovered a whole lot more than chicken in their bucket. There was over $800. Much of that was in cash. But the man and his date did something unusual. He quickly put the money back in the bag. They drove back in that car to the, the store. And then they, when they arrived, the manager was frantic. The man customer got out. He walked in and became an instant hero when he said to the manager, I want you to know I came by to get a couple of chicken dinners and wound up with all this money here. And the manager was just thrilled. He said, oh, oh, let me let me say thank you. And let me, more than that, let me call the newspapers. I'm going to have a picture in the local paper. I want to put you two in there. You're the most honest man I've ever seen. To which the man quickly responded, oh, no, oh, no, don't do that. And then he leaned in and whispered to the manager. And he said, you see, the woman I'm with, uh, she's someone else's wife. No, 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 no. Today, I want to talk to you about having integrity in every area of life. Amen. And especially in times of adversity, when you're laboring in a world of just trying to muddle through. Because that's what Joseph is doing. Let me try to read you chapters 37 to 40 in Joseph's life. Joseph is shining in the integrity of of these early years of his life despite adversity that he is facing. In chapter 37, Joseph's life begins with what is called unhealthy favoritism when his dad gave him a coat of many colors. That coat triggered his brothers to despise him. They hated him enough to want to kill him and when he went to check on on them when they were watching sheep. They decided they would kill him, throw him in the pit, hope he would die. The two brothers objected, so they stayed the murder. Instead, they sold him to a caravan of Ishmaelites. Now, do you remember who Ishmael is? Ishmael was Abraham's wild son through the concubine Hagar. And they were later disbarred from Abraham's camp and sent away. And so they were adversaries to the family of Abraham who descended from him. Well, these Ishmaelite descendants were on their way to Egypt. And Ishmael's descendants probably had a lot of fun with the descendant of Isaac. They, they probably are no, if you, if you think about it, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. Then Jacob, then Joseph. There's only three generations apart, and these Ishmaelites are going to have this Hebrew boy, and they're going to make fun of him. They got him as a menial possession, and, and they're enemies of Jacob's family. And then they, in turn, sell Joseph as a slave to the Egyptians. We, we studied in, in Bible study on this Wednesday, chapter 43, that uh, the Hebrews and the Egyptians, they, they were detestable to each other. They didn't really want to have affiliation and wouldn't sit at the same table to eat. And so Joseph becomes a slave in Egypt, Egypt where he is detestable. Joseph could not change these early years of adverse circumstances but we see he maintained integrity during this season of his life. Now let's go to the next slide. And I want you to see in Egypt, Joseph was purchased by Potiphar, the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. And Joseph distinguished himself with a skill set that he had that it allowed him to interpret dreams by the aid of God. And he, he led Potiphar's house. In Genesis 33, we, we assume that 
Joseph has gone into his 20 something years. And in verse 6 of 39, it says, Joseph is well built and handsome. That's another way to say he's a hunk. He, he's great looking. Verse 7, after a while, Potiphar's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. Nothing subtle about that. Potiphar's wife becomes the original cougar or the original desperate housewife. She made repeated propositions to Joseph. Now think about this 20-something young man sitting there, detestable by most previous Egyptians, and being asked to become it. So might excuse Joseph because of his adverse situation. He's alone in a foreign country. He has no family support. He's young. Everybody's doing it. Why not? But he doesn't act on the proposal from Potiphar's wife. And I want you to think about Potiphar's wife. Since Potiphar is one of the most powerful men in Egypt, chances are Potiphar's wife is in some old hag in rollers that wear curlers in her hair. The temptation was real, but Joseph refused the advances. He maintained integrity when no one was looking. Former Congressman J.C. Watts said, Integrity is doing the right thing when no one is looking. And so Joseph stands as a model for, for youth and adults of all ages that we ought to be people who have integrity when people are watching or when they are not. Joseph demonstrated integrity in the privacy of that home, and we are called to do the same. Genesis 39, the next chapter here. Let's move on. Telling us that Joseph's integrity cost him years in a dungeon. Now, when Joseph fled the scene, not welcoming the advances, uh, Potiphar's wife grabbed his robe and she used it to accuse him. And Potiphar took the bait and he put him in the prison. In Genesis 40, Joseph continues to shine and isn't long he's in the prison with other prisoners there. And the warden sees his gifts and he puts him in charge of the whole prison. And it's in that time of waiting to be released from prison that he helps the cupbearer and the baker. And then we heard that here that uh, they have two dreams. And of course, Joseph was honest. He had integrity. When the baker told him his dream, Joseph said, you know what? In three days, you're going to die. You're going to be impaled. And that happened. Likewise, Joseph was honest about the cupbearer's dream. He said, in three days, Pharaoh's going to raise you back to the role as cupbearer in Egypt. The thing is, when the cupbearer left the prison, he made a plea to that cupbearer, don't forget the good I have done for you. And how God has helped me tell you your future would be bright. But what happens is the cupbearer does not remember the integrity, does not remember the kindness, and forgets about Joseph and goes on his way for years. You know, as he's waiting there for something good to happen in his life, he, the wheels of God's justice just seems to have ground to a halt again. Genesis 41 1 says, Two full years passed, and the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. And then there was a God event. Pharaoh had a dream. And when he had a dream and he asked people, what do you think the meaning was? Nobody had an answer. But the cupbearer finally said, Ah, oh, I had a fellow prisoner who interpreted me in the baker's dream and it came true. Let's go get him to see if he can help. And Joseph was called. And in the dark of the night, he's called from the prison and his life is about to change. And it's all because all these years as a prisoner is waiting for God, he was full of integrity. 
You know, sometimes our life changes on just a flip of a switch. In 1989, Bill Frieder was an assistant, uh, was the coach at Michigan University. And his team was in the NCAA tournament. But he announced before that tournament started that he, at the end of the season, would resign and be able to uh, go ahead and coach over at Arizona State at the end of the season. He thought he could coach the team through the tournament, but the athletic director, Bo Schimbleckler, uh, ordered Free, uh, Frieder to be uh, immediately relieved of his duty, and he tabbed an assistant, very few knew about, on the bench, Steve Frischer, as the new coach as they entered the tournament. Fam uh, Schimbleckler famously announced a Michigan man will coach Michigan, not an era. Uh, Arizona State man. And so in the blink of the eye, Steve Fisher came from a bench warmer to the head coach. And if you remember that year, they went all the way and won the championship that year. He was an interim coach and then later named coach. And for years, he had that championship ring as the Michigan coach. Just about as stunningly unique in the change of opportunity from obscurity to prominence, that's what happened in Joseph's life. Joseph's promotion to leadership was quick. Pharaoh had two dreams he couldn't interpret. Genesis 41, 9. The cupbearer said to Pharaoh, today I'm reminded of my shortcomings, and he told Pharaoh about Joseph. Verse 14. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon, and he was shaved and changed his clothes. He came before Pharaoh. It was like one day he was in prison, and the next day he's in the palace. Bam, it was over. Over. The waiting was done. One day in prison, one day in the palace, one day in misery, one day in glory. And notice in verse 14 it says, when Joseph had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Now someone has asked, what, what, what does that mean? What was the difference there? Um, one person said, well, maybe uh, Pharaoh doesn't like mustaches and beards. No, what it meant was after two more years in the dungeon, he looked awful and he smelled terrible too. He had to change that. And in a blink of an eye, he went from the prison to the palace, and he stood before Pharaoh, and he went to be in the land of prosperity. Now Joseph had a God-given ability to interpret dreams. Pharaoh told him the dream, and he said, God is able to interpret, and God used him to share the message to Pharaoh. And what the message was, was you will have seven years of prosperity. Then there will be followed seven years of famine. And then with that knowledge, Joseph made this proposal. You need someone to administer in the years of prosperity to prepare for the years of famine. And guess who was chosen by Pharaoh? None other than Joseph. And you know, he put him in charge, verse 41. I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Wow. A Hebrew put in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Why? Because of his track record of integrity. Do you remember? Potiphar had put him in charge of his household. The warden had put Joseph in charge of those held in prison. And now on the brink of preparing in these years of prosperity for the years of famine, Pharaoh puts him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now folks, I just want to say this. As we mature through life, we're never going to be put in charge of something if we haven't proven ourselves in private and in past experience. Carl Yastrzemski 
Hall of Fame baseball player for the Boston Red Sox. He won the Triple count, Crown one year, and he also won uh, the American League uh, champion, or the World Series championship in 1969. And here's what he said. He said, I notice the harder I work, the luckier I get. But folks, when we're working and we acknowledge God, it's not luck that causes us to advance. It's God working behind the scenes. Amen. Jesus said in the parable of the talents, you be faithful in a few things, I will put you in charge of many things. And the principle of life has worked over time and time again. Now I just want to move on to the next slide. Just how prosperous was Joseph? I want you to look at the prosperity, from prison to prosperity, that Joseph experienced. Look at this in verse 41. Joseph was in, put in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And that means he had geographic control of Egypt. Do you remember the main river that's running through the, the heart of that city or that country? It's the Nile. The Nile River is a fertile basin. He was in control of making sure that water got to the land. He was in charge of the whole land. Verse 42. Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. That means Joseph had financial independence. Taking the ring off of the king presented Joseph with an open-ended budget. With the king's ring, he could stamp any invoice, authorize any expenditure, pay any amount of money to carry on the king's business in the entire country. It was like Joseph was given Pharaoh's Egypt express card, and he didn't have to leave home with it. Imagine having free reign of the finances of an entire country. That signet ring reminds me of two women who were getting ready to leave the coffee shop in a downtown shopping mall. One lady grumbled, you can't live with them and you can't live without them. And her friend quickly replied, yeah, that's the way it is with men. But the first woman snapped back, who said anything about men? I'm talking about credit cards. Imagine having the free sources of a country at your fingertips. Joseph had. He also had social prestige. Verse 42, Joseph was then dressed in robes of fine linen. In the New Testament, they wore uh, uh, purple as a, uh, uh, a color of royalty. We don't see what the color is, but he got new clothing. But yet, remember, it was his clothing that got him in trouble in times past. The robe of many colors got him in trouble with his brothers. The robe he wore in uh, Potiphar's house got him in trouble with uh, Potiphar. And now we get another robe, but it's a robe of royalty. And I want you to remember, as we discussed in weeks past, Joseph was in the prison with chains on his feet and his neck. He got new jewelry now from uh, Pharaoh. One author said if Joseph had not been in Egypt's prisoner, he wouldn't become Egypt's governor. And the iron chains around his feet turned to gold chains around his neck. What a switch, all because of his integrity. And then Joseph received royal privileges. Look at verse 43. Pharaoh had Joseph ride in a chariot as a second in command. And when people saw him, they said, make way, make way. Can you imagine being a Hebrew slave and prisoner, now being elevated and you get to ride in a chariot? Well, you probably put a license plate on it, number two, because you're second in control. And then, can you imagine when people of the country would say, make way, make way. You know, I, 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 when, whenever you get in the company of a celebrity, it, it's kind of interesting. 
some of the owners would go, there was a Larry Bird game uh, in the summertime, and Larry Bird invited several players from the NBA, and, and this is back in the 80s, I was in youth minister of the Valley Mills Church, and one Sunday night, uh, Lee and I uh, skipped out of church that night to go to the Larry Bird's game. It was to raise scholarship for, for students of Indiana. And uh, on the team one of them was uh, Steve Alford, and of course Steve Alford grew up here in Martinsville. His dad, Sam Alford, was my basketball coach when, when I played in high school. And so I went to the game, we saw the game, and Steve played, and Jerry Seaston played, and Larry Bird played, and Michael Jordan, uh, Magic uh, uh, played, uh, Charles Barkley played, and then a bunch of other scrubs of the NBA. And, and after the game, I went down and I saw Sam and I said, Hey, Sam, can you tell me where the players are? I'd like to hang out in the lobby and just kind of uh, read some of that. And he said, No, I won't tell you. So what Lee and I did, we were without children. We got in the car. We went to five different downtown hotels to try to figure out if the players were staying in that hotel. The fifth Hotel we went to, we saw some NBA players in the lobby. We said, hey, I bet they're here. And so we kind of hung out. We saw Mark McGuire and a couple other players from the Chicago Bulls, and I don't even remember that name right now. And then we saw Larry Bird's brother. We said, oh boy, Larry's got to be here. And so it wasn't very long as we were in the lobby. We heard the dean of the elevator and the elevator opened up, and people were saying, make way, make way, make way. And Lee and I thought, man, we're going to see Larry Bird. You know, it wasn't Larry Bird. It was only Michael Jordan. And we what? Said, oh. What? But we saw that, make way, make way, as he was offshored into a uh, uh, limousine. That's the kind of privilege Joseph got in Asia. And Joseph had political power, verse 44. 44. I am Pharaoh, without your word, no one will lift a hand or a foot in all of Egypt. Can you imagine being able to have the authority to say, you jump, and the only question people ask is, how high? That's what he had. But I want you to know, through all this elevation of prosperity in his life, Joseph had godly reminders. And when you're working and you get to the point of success, don't forget, God has been working behind the scenes. Joseph had a godly reminder. He was given an Egyptian name, Zachiah Pania. And that meaning of that name is to the Hebrew or to the Egyptians, God speaks to him. They knew he had a special gift. God speaks to him. And they named his two sons Ephraim and Manasseh, and both of those sons' names give glory to God, and that was from the Egyptians. They knew through Joseph this family was blessed by the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and now Joseph. And Joseph benefited from the integrity he demonstrated and his children benefited. Joseph went from nothing to having it all. And, and there's a lot of people who go from nothing to having it all and then they blow it. But Joseph didn't. When you get to a point that your life is good and you have some prosperity, J. Oswald Sanders says, not everyone can carry a full cup. Now think about that. How full is your cup of prosperity today? How blessed are you? Are you living a life of integrity and you can handle the shakes of this world without spilling your cup. David rose up to be the king of Israel and he wrote in that famous song, Psalm, my cup 
overfloweth. And he had a lot of problems in his time of prosperity. He didn't handle always that cup holding well. If you're in a place on this Labor Day where you, in hard work through your life, have a blessed cup that is full, be careful. Trust God and manage the rest of your life with a steady hand. Now, how can we manage the future in prosperity? There are several reasons why prosperity has some pitfalls. I want to just look at the next slide. As Joseph stood before Pharaoh, he was elevated to second in command, and he could have failed if he had too much pride in himself. The Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Don't let your ego get out of control. Remember what ego stands for? Edgy God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In your abundance of life, on this Labor Day, be thankful, but don't edge God out giving you thanks. Another pitfall in prosperity is distraction. We can have that full cup and we can navigate life, but if we're not careful, we can get distracted. I like the saying, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy, and he'll take your eyes off the Lord. Another pitfall of prosperity is indulgence. Every now and then we, we, we get to a point in life that we just have this lack of luxury, or, or we have uh, some people in our, our country seats of power, but they have trouble with integrity. Do you know people in our history of America who rose up to power and didn't handle the prosperity well? Richard Nixon, Jimmy Baker, Elvis Presley, Leona Helmsley, Pete Rose, and the list goes on and on. Not everybody can have prosperity and live and handle that success and fame well. If we're not carefully monitoring in our years of prosperity, we can erode the character God wants us to have. An old farmer once observed, when pigs are fattest, that's when they're usually slaughtered. Joseph excelled. He lived in the land of prosperity. He didn't fall to pride, distraction, indulgence. He was a steward and manager of God's blessing for the whole nation. And in seven years of abundance came to them in Egypt. And at the end, the famine began and Joseph was standing tall. And Joseph shined with integrity both in years of adversity and now in prosperity. And he's an example for us all. I'm going to close with this story. How can we and why should we be people of integrity when someone lives with prosperity in the seasons that end our life? It becomes a blessing to our children and those around. In 1945, Branch Rickey was president of the Brooklyn Dodgers. That year, Branch Rickey opened the door for one of the most significant steps forward in the history of American sports. After a year on the Triple A team in Montreal, in 1947, Branch Rickey brought Jackie Robinson to the Dodgers in the sport of baseball and most other sports change forever and for the better. In 1997, the 50th year celebration of that brave act of integrity, Branch Rickey III did an interview with the Indianapolis Star. And here's what he told the reporter at the Star. My grandfather's perception was that there was a major wrong and he was in position to do what was good and right. And after you do that, you don't turn around and say you deserve credit for doing something that was good or right. And I don't think my grandfather ever did. 
And his grandson was saying, my gramps didn't take credit for doing what God would want me to do. Gramps Ricky the third then was asked, what will you remember about your grandfather the most? And the reporter thought he would naturally say the great social of experiment of an integrating Major League Baseball. But instead, Ricky the third said, I'll remember my grandpa for his integrity. Nice. The grandson said he set an example for us. He never set a foot in a ballpark on Sunday because he promised his mother he wouldn't because he was raised in a day when working on Sunday was not what Christians did. He said, I never heard him swear. He set a standard for all of us to see. He lived what he believed. And that has meant everything to the Ricky family ever since. And do you get what the reporter was learning? 50 years after the great act in American history, Branch Ricky's children and all of us Americans are blessed by his brave act of integrity and his life of living his faith in the world he lived. Proverbs 27 is right. The just man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed for it. I stand to you before you today because I was raised by a man of integrity and I and my siblings have been blessed because of that. And I pray that for my daughters and their children yet to come, and that are, that they will be blessed because of my integrity. And I know that's true in so many of you. Joseph's integrity blessed not only his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, but all the sons and daughters of Egypt, and all his brothers and sisters and their children when they came from uh, Israel, to live in Egypt later. And if you really think about it, it's Joseph's integrity that blessed Israel, and through Israel, guess who one day come? None other than Jesus. And so Joseph's integrity and blesses us today through Jesus Christ. Not many of us hold positions of fame, power, prestige, in prosperity. But if we ever get any of that, may we honor the Lord through that position in life. My prayer as I close today is, O oh Lord, give us more people who will live with integrity. That it might bless them, their children, and those who see it in the land. Let's pray. Father, I give you thanks for Joseph. We know in Scripture that he is a type of Jesus. And today we see him as a type of being faithful to Jesus, the Christ. Uh, just as Jesus was called out of Egypt, uh, eventually the family of Israel was called out of Egypt. Father, as Jesus tried to live a life of integrity, we thank you for Joseph's. Father, I pray for every mother and father and every boy and girl in this room that they learn from Joseph the value of integrity and adversity and in prosperity. It is in Jesus' name I pray and all people say. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Because of Joseph and his family, Israel is soon to be born. They're brought out of Egypt eventually under the leadership of Moses. Eventually they have the land of Canaan again. And in that land there was a boy born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. We believe that child born was the son of God. His name is Jesus. And it's because of Jesus that we meet today. We learn of people of old like Joseph that we might know better Jesus 
and that we're indebted for those who are faithful in the past. May we be motivated. May we be faithful. May we follow Jesus. Today, in the name of Jesus, I introduce him to you. If you might happen to know him and need him as your Lord and Savior, we offer the instructions that were said on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Maybe today you could turn to God to repentance. Maybe today you could be baptized. The Bible says they accepted the message. 3,000 were baptized. Would you accept the message? Would you say, yes, I believe in Jesus? Would you let that be known on this day if you have not before? Maybe you come from a tradition where your family brought you up in faith and, and you know Christ is Lord and He is your Savior. But maybe you're looking for a home church. We ask that uh, you honor the name of Jesus. Would you make a confession of Jesus? And then we would welcome you as partners in ministry in His name. Today, that invitation to accept Christ, partner with us in Christ. And if you also have a need for prayer, you're welcome to come. Let us pray at this time. Would you turn to Jesus as we sing? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is my Lord and Savior.
prior to my surgery, and then all of the get well issues afterwards. I truly felt those prayers. And uh, it's just wild that they give you a shot and you're out, and then two and a half hours later you open your eyes and everything's done. But you don't have any re recollection of what's going on while you were asleep. It's just an empty black space. And uh, But I just praise the Lord for sending some Christian doctors that did my surgery. Now, he had a hand in it. And I give him all the praise and all Amen. the glory. And I love him with all my heart. Amen. Amen. Oh, praise God. I'm sure many of us have some testimonies we need to share. It's good to see Ann Anderson here today. Last Sunday, she uh, went to the hospital with uh, a little bit of an ailment, and she overcame real quick, and she's with us today. Uh, we have her. Uh, I know Steve Brock and Stephanie Brock and at least two granddaughters are home uh, dealing with that same kind of illness. We need to keep them in our prayers. Uh, give them a call. David Clark also has that same ailment. So would you just pray and uh, when you leave today, just high five and fist bump. Don't shake hands and get too close with a hug. <laughs> you never know uh, what, what we might pass in good fellowship today. God bless you for being here today. Uh, if you're a guest, I hope you have heard from God's word and I hope uh, God is calling you to his side and that we can be of help to you. Father, would you use this place of worship? May we be a lighthouse to this community. Father, thank you for this Labor Day that to, uh, many who could with the free day of today and tomorrow uh, been out with good activity, but they chose better activity to worship you. Mm -hmm. May we have been stronger because of that. Thank you for this beautiful family of God. Yes. May we uh, celebrate our faith today and tomorrow. And of course, Father, we give thanks to Jane and Abel and her birthday today. It is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for joining us online. You've been such a blessing, and we are very blessed by your presence here. We wish, as always, that you would come into the building next Sunday and worship right alongside of us. But if for any reason you cannot, please come back to this. We'll be here next Sunday online as usual, and we're so, we will be so blessed um, by your presence. Have a great and wonderful holiday tomorrow. Have a great and wonderful week. We'll be blessed all week long. And one way or another, we will see you next week.